How's it going, you rakes, cads, and floozies? It is Synth Daddy Vulture Culture, and I want to know if the Arturia SQ80V can compare to the original Insonic SQ80 from 1988. I think the synthesizer is the cat's pajamas, mostly due to the Curtis CEM filter chip that's in this. That's a 3379 integrated chip that's very similar to the famous CEM 3320 chip that you could find in the Oberheim OBXA and OB8 on the 24 decibel per octave mode. So this is fixed at 24 decibels. The Oberheims had a multi-mode filter, so you could also swap to 12 decibels an octave. Last year, Arturia put out the SQ80V, which is claimed to be a faithful software emulation of the original hardware hardware and as well as expanding on it by giving you the trans waves from the VFX and you know all the niceties of a modern VST. What I want to know is does it effectively replace buying this ancient piece of technology from a defunct company or is there still a reason to buy a vintage synthesizer like this today? Last week on stream I programmed some patches using the original interface of the SQ80. I do have a SynthArc programmer which is really cool but you don't need it. The actual layout of the SQ80 is really really awesome uh, at, a, at a time where one knob per function was just not financially viable. And one of the coolest features in the SQ80V software is that you can actually load the SysX from a real SQ80 and load those patches into it. So I've dumped the SysX onto the computer. I'm going to send that to my friend Grow, who has the software. Thank you very much, Grow. Check out the link to his new EP in the description. He's got the software. He can load the exact patches that I created live on stream, which you can also see that link in the description if you want to see how I made them. While I record the audio of me playing these patches, I'm also going to record the MIDI and send those files to them as well. So if the software emulates it perfectly, we should have more or less two identical files. And then in post, I'm going to normalize them with integrated LUFS to make sure that they're the exact same volume, no tricks. And then for fun, we'll see if you guys can guess which one is the real thing, the SQ80, and which is the software, the SQ80. V. I want to declare my bias that although I believe in theory you should be able to accomplish everything you want to do with synthesis in software and you don't need hardware, I do think a lot of times in practice when companies actually make these products, they uh, let the little details fall through the cracks when they're emulating vintage filters and vintage hardware in general. So I would be very surprised if these sound identical or even all that close. But we'll see. I don't know what the results are yet. Okay, enough talking. I'm going to play the sound and then you guys can guess which is the hardware and which is the software. Let's do it.
Okay, so if you're brave, I want you to pause the video and comment below what you think the original hardware is. So that's gonna be a sequence of five A's and B's. So maybe A, B, A, B, A, or B, A, B, A, B, or A, 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 or B, 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 whatever you think the original in Sonic SQ80 from 1987 is. While I give you guys a second to do that, the thing that helps the channel the most is actually when you guys watch more of these synthesizer videos. So in the description of the video, there's a link that says watch all synth videos. Hit that link. It's a playlist of all of my synth videos I've done. And that really helps the algorithm know and put my videos out there into the dark webs. If you guys watch more of those videos. So please do that. And without further ado, here are the results. So if you guessed B, A, A, B, A, you are correct. Overall, I was shocked at how close they are. I mean, they really do sound almost identical for most of the examples, but in the first one, you can really hear the difference between that true analog Curtis filter and the emulation. Now, it could be that if you adjusted the resonance settings in the software, you might be able to get it even closer. When you just compare loading in the patch into the SQ80V, you do not get all of that glorious analog filter filter goodness that we get with the Insonic. It's just not as cinematic. It's not as squelchy. It doesn't quite have that Oberheimy thing you get with the Curtis chips, but it's really close. I mean, it's not that far off, but there is a little bit of magic in there. In the other four examples, I could barely tell a difference. Like it was so negligible that it was kind of hard to say, which would be even better. In the second and third examples, you can really hear that once you have a little bit of resonance in the filter, the the SQ80V is a little darker sounding, so it actually kind of shaves off a little bit more high end, which is probably better than it sounding too bright because that's going to sound more analog uh, and kind of give you what you want. But it's a little bit darker, actually. And then conversely, on the baseline sound where there isn't any resonance, you can really hear on the transient of the slap bass attack that the software is letting full range of frequencies through, whereas on the actual hardware, there's a little bit of a darker, grittier, 8-bit um, digital oscillator type character that you don't really get in the software. In the last example, once again, it's a little bit darker maybe in the software, but overall they are incredibly close. For examples two, three, and five, it was like kind of a toss up over which sounded better. And in example four, the bass line, I actually preferred the sound of the software. It had a little bit more punch to it. So the big question is, does the software effectively replace owning the original hardware? And I wanna know what you guys think. Do you guys think it sounds good enough that you don't need your old Insonic hardware from back in the day? For me personally, I think in 90% of use cases, the software is more more than good enough to cover all of your bases. And more than that, I think what I really like about it is that it has the character. It has that little bit of magic that made the SQ80 different from everything else at the time. And the software really replicates that in a gorgeous way and is opening up the synth for a whole new generation of synth lovers and electronic music producers out there. And I'm really excited about that. However, I don't think I'm gonna sell my SQ80 because there is a little bit of magic in that last 10% for me with those filters. It is just gosh darn hard to emulate an analog filter as well as Arturia did, but it's still not 100% of the way there. And I still think that it's a really cool piece of technology and it's fun to interact with uh, old technology, especially stuff that's laid out as intelligently as the SQ80 is. Also, for what it's worth, the software is not that cheap. It's like 200 bucks. And you can get an SQ80 for, I just checked on Reverb, like 700 bucks or so. And I actually saw an ESQ1, which is like just the scaled down version of the SQ80 for 500 bucks from Guitar Center. So the price difference between software and hardware really isn't that much, which kind of gives you a reason maybe to get the hardware if you have the space for it. Um, but on the other hand, you know, my SQ80, it's got the uh, internal battery is dying. So I'm going to go have to have that serviced by somebody 
because you can't just replace the battery you have to like solder it in so then that's kind of the problem with vintage sense right is that you have the maintenance and the upkeep and the problems whereas the sq80v is just going to work immediately every time you need to take it with you on a laptop on a plane whatever you've got that sound and you can produce you don't have to worry about lugging around these giant romantic machines so in my opinion is it worth buying an insana keyboard in 2022 i think so i think they're undervalued as a company and as more and more people get into synths their value is going to keep going up they're not making any more of them and anything that has analog filters in it from the 80s is going to appreciate in value so it's a good investment as well as they really do sound great easy to program can give you all of those types of sounds that you love from the 80s whether it's the more dx side of things or the juno 106 side of things it can do it and more it's a great keyboard and as far as the software goes i think it's awesome and i think a lot of people are going to get this as part of the arturia v collection which is i think 500 bucks or so that's really awesome too and by creating a software emulation it sort of enshrines the synth as a classic synth along with things like the obxa the mini moog the cs80 and sonic's never really gotten a fair treatment compared to the big synth company so i'm really excited that a new generation is getting to experience this awesome vintage sound. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. You want to hang out with me? I do a live stream every Wednesday at 9 Eastern. And this one coming up this week is our 100th episode. And for that, I'm going to be looking at a very rare, very special vintage synthesizer from 1984. That's the Fender Chroma Polaris. It is like a bucket list synth I've always wanted to play with. It is analog. It has that ARP sound because if you don't know what the Polaris effectively is is when ARP went out of business it got bought by a few people and eventually their plans for a polyphonic ARP Odyssey-esque synthesizer became the Rhodes Chroma and then Fender bought that and made the Fender Chroma Polaris so it's the only synth Fender ever made and it is just one of the most special synthesizers out there and for our hundredth episode I spent a lot of money and got one so I'm really excited for that and if it's the type of thing if you like synthesizers and vintage synths and making electronic music. Uh, this is probably a really cool channel for you to hang out in and you can ask me all the questions you want live. I love interacting with you guys and that's the beautiful thing about live streaming on YouTube is that I get to hang out with you guys. So if that's the type of thing you want to do, please hang out with us this coming Wednesday at 9 and every Wednesday at 9 basically. I always do a stream on Wednesdays and uh, we've been doing it for a while now and it's really cool. So I just want to say thank you guys for everybody who shows up to every stream and thank you guys for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.